The content you are about to watch is meant for thought and consideration. Please be respectful of each other and opinions shared. This is a safe space to express thoughts, ideas, and information. The views and opinions expressed by individuals in the following program do not necessarily reflect those of every speaker of the IMAC organization or its affiliates. P.S. The Mandela Effect is real. All right, ladies and gentlemen, coming up next, we have Jan Ingalls Smith. Jan is a shaman and uh, initiated her journey in shamanism as well as real life accounts of instantaneous transformation as she observed, including with people who have multiple personality disorders and were able to go back and forth between being blind and sighted. For example, she shares information about soul retrieval, including successful examples of physical and emotional healing with shamanism. She's an author and founder of Light Song Schools of Shamanistic Studies and Energy Medicine. Jan's mission is to provide excellency in energy healing and education and to support personal growth for well-being, adapting ancient healing techniques to contemporary life in the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I present to you Jan Ingalls Smith. Hi, my name is Jan Ingalls Smith, and I'm presenting the topic, The Universes We Inhabit. My website is www.lightsong.net, and if you would like to get a hold of me, you can get a hold of me through that. I'm also offering a free gift from this conference, and you can collect on that free gift through the website also. Working behind the scenes with me today is Shane Robinson, who is another presenter at the conference, and he's in charge of the slides that you'll be seeing. So you'll hear me talking with him periodically, asking him to change slides. So I want to tell you, uh, I'd like to introduce myself with some of my history that prepared me to be involved with IMEC. My undergraduate degrees are in biology and chemistry, and I taught high school level honors courses for about 10 years. My next degrees were in psychology, where I worked both in the disassociative ward in a mental hospital, as well as having a private practice. I eventually became a shamanic healer and energy medicine practitioner, including the creation of a school called Light Song School of 21st Century Shamanism and Energy Medicine. And I've been a practitioner for about 30 years. I am very used to paranormal mysteries. They're the norm for me. Miracles, instant manifestation, the significance of the unexplainable and the unknown. In fact, I work within these mediums every day, all day. <laughs> and so the, the shamanic experience has really prepared me for what we're going to be talking about today. However, when I began my career as a psychotherapist, I hadn't had any shamanic training yet. And I worked with patients who were diagnosed as having dis disassociative identity disorder, or in my day when I was working there, it was called multiple personality disorder which is characterized by the presence of more than one sense of identity within a single human body. In fact, some of these patients may have had as 50 different alters or personality identities. And yes, we do call them alters. That's the common name that we would refer, uh, which is meaning an alternative identity. But I had the opportunity to work with a doctor from Africa who had integrated some very interesting indigenous ritual practices into our hospital setting. And these unconventional approaches proved to be very interesting to a number of the practitioners at the hospital. And so it was decided that we would create a demonstration with patient volunteers to have a panel discussion related to the observations that we were all gonna make. I specifically remember two of the patients in the study. One had cerebral palsy as an illness in one of his alters. Shane, would you please put up the first slide? And you can see that this man is in a wheelchair, which is common for cerebral palsy. They are often restricted to a wheelchair throughout their life. 
There's also deformity of their limbs. Their bones are deformed and their muscles are actually underdeveloped or atrophy of the muscles. So we had a doctor come in and do measurements and do a diagnosis on this man. And he did incur that, yes, absolutely, this person has cerebral palsy and he is incurable. The second male was completely blind and he had a thick blue film over his eyes. And I know that this picture, this photo is kind of creepy looking, but it really accentuates that blue film because it was pronounced in this man. Eye exams were performed by doctors and yes, it did uh, show up that he was totally blind. Each of the patients then were asked to move into different altars. Uh, the patient with cerebral palsy, the next slide please, Shane, transformed into a robust athletic appearing individual, you know, just like a regular guy. It was amazing. All of a sudden that deformity left <laughs> and he just transformed in front of our eyes. Um, the blind patient became sighted and that blue film disappeared from his eyes. Now this experience affected me in a profound way. In fact, not just that panel discussion, but working with these clients, because it was common in my everyday that the clients that I was seeing or the patients that I was seeing, you know, one might have glasses on and the other one was perfectly sighted or somebody might have asthma and, in another altar they didn't. And so I was used to seeing these instant physical healings. And so what it did for me as a young woman was it implanted in, within me this absolute truth. It's not only possible, but it happens on a regular basis. Even though I didn't know how it happened, and I don't think psychology really understands that either, but we all witnessed it. So we have that in our in our wherewithal that this can happen. About that same time, I had a spiritual awakening. Now this was very odd. Uh, I had been religious and had been ra raised in a traditional Christian home. Uh, slide please, Shane. But an old indigenous woman appeared in my living room <laughs> asking me to learn the ways. Now this slide is not of her, but she looked very similar to this. She had gray hair and it was pulled back tight in a bun. She was extremely wrinkled and she had a wool blanket around her, her arms. She warned me that my life would forever change. And I was gonna say no, you know, like I was in this state of shock. How'd you get into my house? What are you doing here? You know, I was ready to kick her out, you know, like go away. I was, it was actually quite unnerving. But there was a crow that was cawing outside the window. And instead of hearing caw, 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 I was hearing trust, trust, trust. So I said, yes. And uh, we did a little ceremony that sort of sealed the deal. And, you know, this is a long story and it's actually written up in a couple books that are available, but, um, yeah, I, I heard something and I turned thinking that somebody had come into the room and when I turned back, she had disappeared. Now there I was standing there, like what just happened? And I, you know, I was trying to make sense of it. Um, I tried telling my friends about it, my husband about it, but people just, basically didn't believe me. Uh, they thought that the stress of working with these multiple personalities was just getting to me. To color the story a little bit more, I had a two and a half year old and infant twins at the time also. <laughs> so my life was very, very stressed. But still, I knew what I had seen and I knew how I had interacted with this person. They were physically there for me. But people started deserting me and literally my life started falling apart. In fact, I was actually 
asked to leave my Sunday school class. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, I felt like people were going to burn crosses in my front yard. It was, uh, it was horrible. It was horrible. Even though I'm smiling about it now, it was probably the most difficult time of my entire life. Fast forwarding today, and there's a lot of interesting things in there to fast forward through, but I am fast forwarding today. Uh, I learned the ways, and to me, what I was guided was the ways was to learn shamanism. So I went and had all the training for that and graduated from a program, and now I'm almost 30 years in. I also started the school that I was telling you about uh, at the beginning, and we're the only school in the United States that actually offers bachelor's, master's, and doctoral programs in shamanism and energy medicine. And I've done over 3,500 soul retrievals, which is an ancient healing ceremony where you're working intimately with the unseen worlds. So again, I have had countless, countless miracles and witnessed countless unexplainable events. At least they're unexplainable to our rational mind. Fast forwarding again till about the last five or seven years, I run a spiritual retreat every summer. And this summer will actually be our 34th one. And we use some land in Tillamook, Oregon. And I'm very familiar with this land. There's a road that I walk every day, sometimes several times a day. And I know exactly where I am at any given moment on that road. This one day I was walking along the road with Terry, who is another lead at the retreat. And we were crossing a small bridge with a little creek underneath it. And I looked at him and I said, Terry, where did these boulders come from? Now, again, this is not the actual picture of these boulders, but these boulders were huge. They were the size of cars and they were right there in this creek bed. And Terry laughed at me and he said, well, Jan, do you want the geological explanation of how they got here? And I realized what a goofy question it was, but seriously, I had never noticed them before. And they were these prominent features right there. And in my line of work, being in shamanism, these would be considered grandmothers or grandfathers or gatekeepers of the area or of the creek. And it would be very traditional to greet them and to say hello and to honor them in some way. So for the next several years, I became very animated with this and had a lot of fun because every time I passed by, I made it a big deal to say hello to these, uh, to these boulders. So about five years later, I'm walking down the road again with Colleen, who is another lead at the retreat. And we get to the creek and I look over and I say, Colleen, where's the boulders? And she said, what boulders, Jan? And I said, the boulders that I've been greeting for the last five years that are right there. And she said, there's no boulders here, Jan. Right then I knew. I knew that I was being shown something that I was supposed to learn about. Be why did I think that? Because I work with the spirits and they do these things all the time to me where they're presenting materials to me that I, they want me to learn. And I realized that there was something about parallel realities or different dimensions. I didn't know exactly what it was, but I went back to camp and I told everybody about my experience. When I got home in a very serendipitous way, so to speak, I was connected to Cynthia Sue Larson, who is also a big portion of this um, conference. And she told me of her research on the Mandela effect, which I found fascinating. As one dimension, something is there, another dimension, it isn't. Or one dimension, something expresses itself one way, like Nelson Mandela lying in, dying in prison. In another dimension, it is different. He died recently. What I realized is that parallel dimensions are mostly the same but slightly different. And these differences are what I call markers. 
So for me, the marker was the boulders. Everything else about the creek and the land seemed the same, but the boulders were marking these differences for me. So the following year, we returned to the land and set up camp. Slide please, Shane. And I want you to realize that the boulders were my experience and I was telling the camp about it, but they didn't have an experience, but this year it was all about them. So as you can see, there's a, there's a tent here, we call it our prayer tent. And the end of the slide is just about the halfway mark of the tent, it extends on in the other direction. I set my chair in the center of the tent and then we built the fire pit and then the lodge so that my heart lines up out of the tent through the center of the fire pit and into the door of the lodge. And Shane should be showing you that with a marker right now. That's normal. But this year when we set up the tent and the tent can only fit in one place. I had the tent custom made and there's objects at both ends that don't allow us to go over um, that specific area. So anyway, we were setting up the tent, got it all done, I placed my chair, and I'm off to the right about six or seven feet, way off to the side. And people are looking at me and they're saying, Jan, what are you doing way over there? And I said, well, I'm lined up. I'm sitting here and I'm making a line from my heart through the fire and into the lodge door. So what we were being shown was a marker. In this particular dimension, everything on the land was shifted over about six or seven feet. And so this was for the camp. They really got that. Like I said, the boulders before were for me. Now they're having an experience like, oh my God, they could see it. Then next we go out for walks and there's this one place that we try to get to that's on a path that is very, you know, it's overgrown. You have to kind of book, bush, bushwhack through, whatever that word is, bushwhack through it. Slide please. And there's this fir tree that's down. And again, this is not the actual picture of the tree, but a, a giant fir tree is laying on its side, blocking the path. And it's probably 30, 35 feet long, and it's very large. So we would often station people at the side of the fir tree and help give you a hand or hoist you over if you couldn't make the step up and over. So we, as a group, go to this place, and there's probably 60 or 70 of us, and we go to this place and the, the fir tree's gone. There is no fir tree there. There is no sawdust. There is no indication that the tree was ever there. And again, this was a marker for all the people in the camp where they were having firsthand experience where they knew something was always there and now it's different. The theme of the spiritual retreat that is consistent through the years is that the earth is ascending or changing in its frequency of vibration, which started about 1986. And we have been working with a theme of the new earth in, is being created. Slide please, Shane. An earth that is the same, but slightly different an earth that is in a different dimension, a different dimensional frequency than what we have going on today. Again, we've been working with this for a long time. In 2013, there was an astrological stargate that opened for these ascension energies. And I was led to this information from some native elders that were working with this on the reservations. And the Stargate was going to open at a very particular time. It just so happened, as it would be, that that was exactly the week that I had the retreat planned. Slide, please. So I had the actual astrology chart created 
so that we could do ceremonial work with these alignments. And on the chart, I had crystals that were imbued with the energies that represented the different planets and different orbs that we were working with in the sky. <clears throat> and we did a ceremonial opening of our version of, you know, opening the Stargate. And that's me, you know, working with the Stargate right there. The next uh, slide, please. And this is an actual picture of someone, her name is Karen, standing by the altar after it was opened. And this paranormal image was captured right there, which we are all just fascinated with. And now I have a greater understanding of actually what we're looking at. <laughs> so for me as a healer, my interest in parallel dimensions has to do with healing. Uh, going back to my experience in the mental hospital, I feel that possibly multiple personality expression can actually be where we witness a parallel dimension of a person. Again, the same, but different. So how can this relate to someone that has a tumor or an illness? In one expression, they have it. And I'm talking an everyday person, not somebody that has multiple personality, but in one expression, they have it. Can we get them into the other expression that they don't? In shamanism, this is experienced often after ceremony where a declaration would be say, there was a, there was a healing that took place where there would be a dramatic difference in a person. But what if the ceremony just created the atmosphere for the shift to happen in realities? that these multiple versions of self already exist in other dimensions. And to learn how to shift awareness into one of these expressions could be used for self healing. And or that the new earth is here already. That's what the spirits keep saying to me. It's already here. It's not that we have to create it. We just have to shift into that parallel reality. So the potentials and the possibilities are really unlimited. So my line of focus right now then is how to facilitate others to shift into the desired version of themselves. And you can see in this slide that, you know, when you look into a mirror, you see infinite versions of yourself that just go on and on and on. But this is really what parallel realities and different dimensions is all about. The possibilities are unlimited. So even if you could look at each one of these versions of this person standing there with the camera, if everyone was the same but slightly different, and you could ask yourself, which version do you desire for yourself? Is it health, relationships, finances, a combination? Again, every version of you exists in a parallel dimension. It's all possible in unlimited options. The same you, but different. Different in your health, different in your relationships, different in your finance. So I believe that the more that we speak about the Mandela effect, the more positive energy that we generate on the subject, the more markers will be noticed by others. We're bringing it very much into the collective. In fact, I was watching a program with my grandson the other day, and it was Spider-Man of the Multiverses, where they had all these different versions in different dimensions of Peter Parker. <laughs> and I thought, this is great. They're feeding the little itty bitties with this information. So they're growing up with this understanding. And the more people will realize that they hold the power of creation within them, that this is not, not a phenomenon, it's a possibility. It's here for us to work with. And that's why it's presenting right now in such a big way. So if you're interested in experiencing a guided meditation where I can walk you through a process of unlimited possibilities and get you in contact with your super self, please go to my website. I have a super self meditation for free, which is designed to introduce you to the many different versions of yourself.
So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Wonderful to have you here, Jan Ingle Smith. That was a wonderful presentation. Thanks for being here. Yeah, brought up a lot of interesting things. A lot of interesting things. We appreciate your perspective. Absolutely. <laughs> it's different. <laughs> it, yeah, but it's definitely in the right neighborhood. So yeah. it's, in, it's in the right neighborhood and it's definitely uh, needed. I, I believe so. Right. I, so, so I like how it's about really taking more of a proactive role in doing these shifts, you know, and you've seen it with these patients, which is incredible. And, and um, I guess you can go a little bit more into uh, how you first came across the Mandela effect, maybe. Well, again, my, my experience with the Mandela effect happened to me. You know, I didn't, I wasn't studying different people's uh, or logos or, you know, Mandela or any of that type of thing. My first experience with it was with the boulders and they were there and then they weren't there that I could name. I've been experiencing Mandela effects a good portion of my adult life. I can't say much for my childhood, but a good portion of my adult life. And I've put it into the category of um, my work with shamanism, because what we do in shamanism and with healing and in ceremony, these things are happening regularly to a whole room of people. And so they're, they're personal experiences. They're not something that you're drawn attention to notice. You're, it, you know, like I, when the, I was standing here in the room when this thing started, how am I across the room standing over here when I didn't know I moved? <laughs> you know, I mean, they're phenomenal and they're amazing. And so I, I was sort of used to that. In fact, I'm very used to it. Um, it happens regularly in my world. But then when the boulders happened, that really caught my attention. Because again, we've been working uh, at Light Song with this concept of the new earth and the ascension energies since like 2008 or seven, somewhere in there. So I've been very involved with them and working closely uh, with how to work with these shifts. And I did not know about the Mandela effect, but when the boulders happened, I was like, oh, the, I'm being shown something here to pay attention to. And that's when my world opened up with, oh, there's a whole community. There's a whole network of people out here that are noticing things. And I'm just kind of like last kid on the block here coming in, even though I had been living it, you know, for a good portion of my life. But again, it seemed the understanding of, of different dimensions and traveling in different dimensions and working in different dimensions to do healings on people, like going into the past so that you can heal an event that took place in the past for someone. And the spirits will often say, you will now have a new set of memories, your DNA changed. And, you know, and when I was teaching biology, uh, we learned, you know, it was taught that your DNA was static. You, what you were born with, you you got, you know. Now we know, notice that it changes with every emotional experience that you're having. And so, you know, the spirits would be saying, your DNA is changing. You're going to have new memories now because we've just changed the events. We've given it a new ending. And so I was used to this stuff um, and had a, a lot of different experiences with it, but out of a different vocabulary or cosmology of explaining it. <laughs> You're actually muted, Chris. <laughs> I said something really clever. No. Oh. <laughs> I knew it. Yeah. Did you want to ask one of the first questions, Shane, or do you want to go back and forth? Uh, let's see. I've got, uh, I've got one ready to go here. I can ask okay. um, question. This is from the rip on rabbit. Cole, have you ever witnessed two separate patients with multiple personalities that became synced? Two separate individuals sharing one and the same personality. No, but I will say something similar to that, which, um, which was really, again, caught my attention. 
And this was a client that I had in many, many years ago, before I even realized that there was sort of um, the incarnation and all this. Because when I came into this work, I was coming out of a, a very strict Christian background that didn't have any of this in its um, teachings. Okay. And so uh, working with spirits, incarnations, other lifetimes, all these things, I had to, I learned about personally through my process of doing soul retrievals, which, you know, I've done a lot. I've done over 3,500. And so that's a lot of experience under my belt. But anyway, this one man, he was young. Uh, he was having uh, a problem with uh, drugs and alcohol. He was a musician. And when John Lennon died, he, he felt John enter his body, unbeknownst to him. He just felt this thing come into him, didn't know that John had died. And then the next thing you know, he's kind of obsessed with um, uh, Beatle songs and wants to just do Beatle songs. <laughs> And he dedicates his life to impostering John Lennon, okay? So when I get him as a client, he's coming to me and he's saying, you know, my life is involved with this. I need to, I need to explore things myself. And he was laughing. He says, I need to hang up my Sergeant Pepper suit. <laughs> you know? But anyway, when I got into the journey, what the spirits were showing me was two people superimposed um, like this, uh, where their bodies were on top of each other and they both had their arms off to the side. And I was asking what that meant. And they were showing me John and then my client. And they said, John and your client are the same soul that is incarnating in the same timeline. But John was about 20 years older so when John phys physically left his body, he just rejoined the rather other part of him in your client's being. <laughs> is that, I, that doesn't make sense. But anyway, no, it does the point sense. being is, is that that really allowed me to see these, you know, we are more than what we think. And I remembered the song, uh, you know, I am the walrus, I am he and he is me and we are all together. You know, it was just like, yeah, like John had these insights <laughs> as to when he was writing this song. And then, of course, my client was living out this um, this experience. So when we did the healing, what we did was we we separated the memories, you know, so that John could have his and my client could have just his and he could live his life as himself. So <laughs> I know I can sound really weird sometimes, can I? <laughs> Jan, to me, you sound totally normal <laughs> because part, part of like for myself with my journey was discovering these concepts like reincarnation and things like that, that I had no idea about why well, I'd heard about them and thought that that's crazy nonsense, but how everything plays in. And it is like, we're, we're much more than what we yeah. think we are. Yeah. And it, it all goes back to that. And we have had other lives and we will have other future lives, et cetera. Yeah. It's, getting that, it's all an understanding of our quantum reality. Exactly. And that's, that's what I think makes shamanism so powerful and uh, also why it works so well is because it sees humans not as a body, but as a spirit having a human experience. And that spirit is just, or a soul or a consciousness, you can use all of those words uh, synonymously, but that consciousness is just fractionally in you. Like I always think of a, uh, of a pyramid, I mean, excuse me, yes, a pyramid over somebody's head and the apex is coming down right here into your pineal gland. And just that little point, enough of that consciousness is entering the, the skin, the body to animate you and to give you life. But the bigger portion of you, the 99.9% .9 of you isn't here. You're out into this bigger version of yourself uh, in the field of what I call all possibilities, all positive possibilities. I mean, you could, I don't go into any other fields, but the positive possibilities. And so you have access to that. In fact, that's the free gift that I'm offering to people that want to go to my website right now from the show 
is a, a meditation that I call your super self, which actually allowed I through guided imagery, I get you into this version of yourself. And then you're allowed to, you know, gather your dreams, your prayers, your intentions and pull them into you. Because when you're in this expanded state, your vibration is much higher. And so you're a match for what you're actually wanting or desiring. You have a greater capacity to pull that into your system and feel the changes than you would if you're in the dumps and you're going, oh, my life has just got to be changed, you know, and you're angry and you're mad. You can't really get there from there. It has to be in a higher vibrational state. And so it's, it's that imagery or that acknowledging and finally the belief and understanding that you're so much more than just a human being. You are, you are creator, really. You are magnificent and you're omnipresent. And so, you know, all of these things of bilocating and being in multiple, you know, it, it's all part of what we're designed to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of truth and wisdom to what you just spoke. And yeah. to me, it seems like my goal is always trying to merge more with what I call my higher consciousness, or mm -hmm. some people call your higher self, whatever terminology you want to use. Yeah. You really have to get yourself to that point of being at a, at a higher frequency mm -hmm. to be able to accept that. Okay. And uh, yeah, and to be have access to that, to that all that knowledge and that big database of information and yeah and wisdom and experiences that our higher consciousness has. So I really appreciate you bringing that out. Yeah, and a lot of people don't know how to do that. And that's why I did the, the guided imagery because I just take you there and then you just follow the prompts and you have your own experience, of course. But yeah, it's, it's learning how to, um, to develop these things within yourself that I think is what needs what is needing to happen with all of this. I mean, people have a lot of um, fantasy around it and a lot of awe, but we want to get people to be more efficient with how to create the better life that they desire for themselves. Right. And the Mandela effect just shows us the possibilities that these things are, are true and they're possible. That lets us see beyond what we perceive reality to be. Be like, yeah. wow, there is so much more. Absolutely. We've actually had a couple of questions come in that we can get to here. Uh, let's see. How would one determine whether or not a shaman is qualified to conduct transformative practice? Of course, yeah. you're talking about the school, right? But how do you know? Because, I mean. This is one of the reasons I developed the school, actually, because um, I felt that, you know, when you're dealing with somebody's soul, you have to be really well trained. And there's a lot of fly by nights, you know, they'll take a class or they'll, you know, go down to Peru for a weekend. <laughs> you know, they want to do things and we don't do anything with ayahuasca or any drugs. Um, and so, yes, I have the school. There's, there's, there are sites that you can go on to that will have recommendations of uh, shamanic practitioners in your area. Um, anybody that we have doing this kind of work has been in training for at least five or six years. And so they, you know, they know what they're doing. And so you can contact the school and be led to a practitioner and or teacher. And now with everything online, of course, we, we have a much um, broader uh, outreach to people because we're doing a lot of the training online. Perfect. And we want to thank uh, Nacha Keta for that one. Uh, we got a couple more from Daisy here. I don't know if you got these or not, Chris, but I'll go ahead and Diane Cannon had photos and was told that the earth is zapped at certain times with energy of sorts. Can you tell us anything about that? Well, like Chris was saying earlier, you know, the sun activity is, is off the charts right now with solar flares and uh, electromagnetic uh, stimulation and you have to realize that we're electromagnetic beings and our wounds and our um, 
you know, the, the things that bog us down, the heavy weights that we carry, the, the worries, the doubts, those are energies too, and they're dense. And, and when the sun is doing these things and the earth is being bombarded, she's in this place of ascension, that means her um, fields of energy are going up, they're rising. And we're on the earth, and so ours are rising too. And so if you don't get in alignment with that, it can feel like you're being bombarded with negativity because you've got this, this heavy stuff on. You're not open and really receiving this and expanding with her. You are, you're in resistance to it. And so, yes, this is part of the ascension process, the earth being bombarded with these. It's not only coming off the earth, it's coming off the central sun in the middle of the Milky Way. That's what all of, you know, 2012 was about, um, the ending of particular cycles and the ascension now, the energies that, that stargate that i was opening in 2013 was the new energies coming in unaffected by the um oppression and the things that had been implanted on uh human beings or um bird just hit my window <laughs> uh, uh human beings you know for many, many years. And so I, I see this as just such an amazing time in human history. I mean, we are, this is why we incarnated to be here, to be part of this. And, you know, I just find it very exciting. I, I think I heard the bird say trust. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm saying that to him right now. I hope he didn't hurt himself. <laughs> just attracted to your light, Jan, that's all. Well, you know, I do, the animals in my yard are quite extensive, yes. <laughs> they come in. <laughs> okay, I have a question for you from Nashikita. Um, what does Jan think about ayahuasca and DMT? You know, I think anybody that wants to use um, any mind altering drugs, that's their choice. Um, but to me as a, as a psychologist and as also, you know, somebody that works with spirit, I see it as a three-way conversation because in shamanism, we know that everything that exists has an agenda. It has a purpose. It has a spirit and a soul that give it then certain properties there's only two things really on the planet that don't have that, and but I'm not going to get into that right now. But when you're ingesting something that's going to alter your mind, um, you and you're trying to connect to the divine or the greater source, you're going through a filter. You you have your agenda, and the plant has its agenda. Okay, and so it's a three-way conversation instead of a direct line to spirit, like. I need to learn how to alter my mind because of my focus and my heart opening, not because something opened it for me. And that way you're, you're dealing directly with spirit. It's, it's just you're divine and spirit is divine and it's a divine connection. I'm not to say that I, I mean, I have lots of friends. I've been to Peru a couple of times myself. I, don't participate, I don't feel like I need it. I've already got the connections that people are looking for. And in the training in our school, that's what we're trying to gain with people, this really sense of your divinity and being able to speak directly to divinity to be able to communicate and to receive healings and to do the work that you're being asked to do. Thank you for that. That make that makes sense the way you've expressed that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I see one from Daisy. In your early patients, was the handicapped personality aware of the healthy personality? Then they were. When they get into the hospital, there's awareness that's coming in. They they don't have that awareness out there in the world. Like we would have people that had different families, different careers, different. They lived in different places, sometimes even different states, you know. Um, and one of the things to identify of multiple is uh, there's usually lapses in time in their memory. 
that, you know, I don't remember fifth grade or I don't, you know, things like that. And those are some of the little clues that um, you would have as you're working with them. But by the time they get in the hospital, yes, there is awareness and they're working on integrating uh, their different personalities together in different fashions. Thank Perfect. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have a question here. Um, have you found that people's gifts, that, by the way, this is from JoJo's, uh, gifts abilities have grown greatly since they have become aware of the Mandela effect? Oh, yeah. I mean, the Mandela effect to me is um, bringing things into the collective. And when things are in the collective, they become much more accessible. Like you can't see anything that you don't have reference to, okay? Um, there is a great film called uh, What the Bleep Do We Know? It came out many years ago in Portland. And uh, there was a, a, an example of a shaman standing on the shores in South America, looking out at the ocean, but couldn't see any ships, the ships that were coming to invade. It's because they had never seen a ship before. It was not in their collective, but he noticed the ripples on the water. And as soon as the ship appeared, then everybody could see it. And so it's the same thing with the Mandela effect. As more and more people are talking about it and these conferences are going on, it makes a bigger broadcast in the collective so that more and more people can start having the experiences and doing something with it. You know, like, how do you want this to affect your life? You have, you have so many options. You have just an infinite amount of options to choose from in any given moment of how you want things to be and how you want them to turn out. And so my, my job as a teacher and as a practitioner is, you know, how to empower people, you know, really get this in them so that they know that they, they are a resource for this, that they can actually make the changes that they desire for themselves. Excellent, I love that. It's I got a great question. Empowerment. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, this one comes from Ch Francesca Henderson. Great question, because a lot of us in the uh, ME community have come across this question where we wonder why other people don't see it. Why don't people see this? Why do they act strange, you know? So the question is, do you think there are soulless people here sometimes called backdrop people or non-player characters, NPCs, empty seaters is another name. So just sort of like shells of people, I guess. In my cosmology, absolutely not. Everything has a consciousness down to a rock. You know, that's why I talk to rocks. You know, everything is alive. Everything has spirit consciousness. It's all part of the divine, the planet incarnated is an incarnated spirit just like we are i mean she chose to be the planet you know i mean you're just you're just shape-shifting and moving into different uh expressions continually we'll call it the mandela effect or different you know dimensions but you're this goes on for infinity for forever you're just experiencing and experiencing and experiencing the soul consciousness wants to experience and so Consciousness might want to experience being sort of dead inside, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. what's that experience like? And so there's no, there's no judgment here. It's just people just choose to express themselves. Now, as far as the, the Mandela effect, the way that the spirits have explained it to me is that it, you have control. You, you have choice. We call it free will. They call it sacred choice. And you have choice in life. And that's, that's what puts human beings apart from so many other beings at all of, all of you know, uh, life on the planet, as well as a lot of extraterrestrial life, is that we have free will. And that free will can be a, a double-edged sword. Can you, and you can decide not to believe. And if you decide not to believe, you have then said, no, I don't want the information. You know, that's how it's read. I don't, I don't want to experience it. I don't want it. And so you're not aligning with it. Uh, Nicole did a beautiful job with talking about her alignment with, you know, when she was talking about um, 
when dark forces come in and she's going, no, that's exactly right. You, you, you can align with what you want to align with. And if people are saying no, you know, then they, that can be honored. Can I expand on that question a little bit? Sure. sure. Okay. One of, one of the things that I have really researched that I think is, is quite amazing um, is the differences between the right brain and the left brain. And the way that this came into existence for me was um, I asked the spirits one time, I said, how much of reality do we actually see? And I thought they were going to say something like, oh, 20%, you know, but they said less than 1%. I was like, less than 1%? We're blind. <laughs> you know? And then as it would be that same week, I, I got a, you know, I study a lot of quantum physics and somebody sent me an article that said in the quantum world, they were doing studies that human beings perceive less than 0.1% of the reality that is around them. So that was like a qualifier for me. And so that then started a whole bunch of questions to the spirit about then how, how can we see? And they started talking about the difference between left brain and right brain. And that, you know, most of us now and a good portion of the world, unfortunately now are what we call left brain dominant. And when you're in left brain, you need to have sequential ordering. You need to have cause and effect. You need to ha know how something happened in order for it to make logical sense to you. The ego is also in the left brain. And so you're always comparing things or putting hierarchy to things and seeing how it fits with you and how safe you're going to be with it. The right brain, and I'm not talking about creativity or music or art or something like about that. I'm talking about really moving into the right brain is where perfect now is. It's only now. Left brain, past, future, no now. Past, future, no now. <laughs> Nobody's in the now, okay? In the right brain, you can achieve now, which is perfect bliss and peace allowing there's no ego there everything is exactly as it should be and it is that that utopia type of thing it's also where the clairs live or what i call the clairs your clairvoyant clairaudient clairsentient it's where the spirits you can see the spirits but you have to do all of this with your eyes closed and have it be dark because we have to take away our sight, our visual sight, in order to go deep into the right brain. And that's what you're doing with meditation. That's what you're doing with journeying. That's what you're doing in, in dreaming. But then what happens with a dream is we're having a dream and then we try to interpret it with left brain explanation. And so I think a lot of people that are having these MEs and are having these incredible experiences are having right brain experiences. They're opening the right side of the brain. Some people call it woo-woo. I say you're becoming whole-brained. Uh, children are born whole-brained. Indigenous cultures were more whole-brained than left-brained. And so, you know, we're just now coming back into valuing this, you know, because everything that we value in our culture has to do with aptitudes, intellect, you know, that's how we're tested in school. Everything that we achieve is all about this left brain. And the spirit says, you're so lopsided. You know, you've got to get over on the other side and start seeing the magic where there's no cause and effect, where you can fly, you can, you know, you can be outside of space and time and, and start creating. Your imagination is in your right brain. And we give that a bad name, like you're making it up. You're not making it up, it's your creative energy. <laughs> you know? Anyway, I just wanted to add that in because I, I just feel that people aren't giving themselves credit for this. And to, to really just say, oh, I don't have to figure it out. I need to experience it. I just wanna be open to the experience. It's an experiential 
um, experience. You know, it's yeah. not something that you can figure out. Now, quantum physics can do a pretty good job of it, but still, we want to get out of that trying to do it and like let's experience this. So, awesome. Appreciate that. <laughs> we have one from Laura Lee. Have the rocks or the trees come back from any of your realities that you mentioned in your presentation? If not, do you feel this reality is better or more high vibe than the previous version with the boulders and the trees? Or tree? Say? Yes. Um, I don't know about the tree and the prayer tent because we haven't been back this year. We had the pandemic, so we won't be on the land. But I believe that in my world, in my personal reality, everything is always getting better. I am constantly improving. I do believe that everybody else is too, that there's a, a natural evolution of life. That's why we're here mm -hmm. to evolve and to understand. I believe it's all about love. Um, and, you know, to me, love is one of those things that i believe that we're made out of love that that consciousness is an energy of love which is actually neutral i'm not saying it's positive it's just this it's a essence mm -hmm. that everything's made out of it's an emotional essence and so if everything is one thing you don't know how to you don't know anything about it until you're not that thing Okay, and to me, that's what life is. Okay, we're love, but we don't know about love until we don't experience it. All right, just that's like so. if everything was blue, you wouldn't know about yellow <laughs> unless there was a comparison. Okay, right. and so I believe that our lifetimes, we are working towards understanding greater capacities of love and what it means to actually be ourselves um and that's what we're doing here and so yes that reality my reality the one that i'm in that i'm seeing these things definitely better you know i'm always calling it forward every day i work with the super cell for working in moving into the different dimensions of me i mean there's multiple dimensions of all of us I want the best version. <laughs> Absolutely. As we all do. Louise yeah. had a quick question here. What are your thoughts on schizophrenia and other uh, severe mental health disorders? Yeah, it's varied. I mean, there's no pat answer for anything. I do feel that we are in a culture that doesn't honor um, the different. You know, we, again, we're very left brain. We want to pigeonhole everybody in a slot. Mm -hmm. And that some people that are experiencing voices and various uh, things like that are actually having uh, shamanic experiences or, you know, enlightening experiences. And because we treat them so poorly and shut them down, they then become ill. You know, now that's not everybody, of course, it's mental illness has got a huge range, but in the indigenous cultures, they were definitely, the oddities were revered, you know, and uh, you were seen as special, which is a very different take than uh, our cultures today. Love that. Jerry, welcome. Thank you so much, Shane. How we doing back here, guys? Sounding Wonderful. Amazing we could, we in the could go another hour easy. <laughs> We're having a blast. I honestly believe that. The questions coming in, my goodness, we have got the smartest people, I swear, on the planet in our chat right now. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> they have got some amazing questions coming in, guys. I cannot thank you enough. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, Jan, thank you so much for the presentation and the Q&A. It's been absolutely fascinating mind-blowing eye-opening <laughs> i'm running out of words so thank you so very much jan yeah you're welcome my pleasure i can talk about it all day <laughs> i honestly believe that and i could honestly sit and listen to you talk about it all day if we had that long uh you'll be back later uh just after the break correct yes yes with the, the imac uh, the uh, ladies at the view <laughs> yeah i love that 
Yeah. Oh, I can't wait for that. It's going to be interesting. It's ladies night at IMAC. Uh, <laughs> Shane and Chris, thank both of you guys so, so very much for moderating this week. We can see we're not needed in here anymore, right? <laughs> I'd love <laughs> to see it too, if you guys could see Yeah, it. that's right. Just go. Just go. No, we'll, I'm totally kidding. We'll totally be watching. Kidding, we'll be observing. <laughs> Always observant. I love it.